it, it's funny, our, our scaling has, and everything we do, our kind of fundamental core of the business has never really changed. What's changed is we're now trying to drive quality for the consumer rather than just trying to line our pockets with cash, right? So yeah. it's a lot more about how can we make the product better? How can we make the customer service better? How can we make the offer more clear and kind of less aggressive? Because that, that's the thing we push, we would push aggressive offers, which wouldn't, you know, wouldn't, we wouldn't force the customer to do any, anything, but it would be, it's one of those things where it's very, very tempting, where they may think that they're getting better value than they possibly are, right? Especially with drop shipping. Say you do makeup, we would have some customers that would love it and be really happy, but others would get it in the stuff and be like in half or cracked. You know, it's, it was really poor. So that's why, you know, a big reason for us moving because our repeat, our, our, our repeat customer rate was just nothing. You know, it's, it was the pits because customers were never happy from really day one. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Robust Marketer. Uh, today I am super lucky to have Sam Venning on the platform with us today. So I met Sam at Tim Bird's Mastermind. I, I think I'm saying this a lot these days because uh, I met so many amazing people at, at his events. Uh, and Sam and his partners were, were just engaged in, in such a cool e-commerce story uh, that I thought it was a great idea to start getting them involved in what we're doing here at ISAC Training. Um, Sam has a really cool story about massive quick drop shipping success that, that a lot of young smart guys are able to get. Um, and then, uh, and then, then, uh, you know, an aspect of that story where it, where it kind of evaporated, where it kind of fell apart a little bit, which is something that happens, uh, to people and, and, and potentially more and more in the business. And what's really cool about their story is then their ability to pivot and dig in and build a really amazing organization, e-commerce X, uh, where they're controlling the distribution, the shipping, the product, all stateside in the US and building out brands. And uh, Sam's specific job is scaling them. So he's here today to talk to about talk to us about that. Welcome to the Robust Marketer, Sam. How are you doing? Yeah, very well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, for having me. Yeah, nice. It was it was such a treat meeting you guys, uh, you and the, the Sangera Bros at uh, at Tim's Mastermind. That uh, I'm really excited to see see what we what we can do together. So why don't we start as we always do with uh, sure. the, the your marketer's hero's journey? Tell us about how you got into the business and, and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, so I I got in really I started studying marketing at university a few years ago, and I wasn't really into it then. I didn't really know what I wanted to do, um, and I took a year abroad and studied in Berlin in Germany, and I had a really really great teacher. Um, who owned his own agency, but he was also doing his PhD, so he had to teach low-level kids like myself. Um, and he just was an open book of information, and he it was absolutely fascinating. You know, I I was blown away by everything he said, and being someone who's very rational, I was really driven by everything he was saying around the numbers side of things and the data. So I really kind of aggressively tried to work with him. It didn't work out. But when I got back to the UK for my last year of university, I wanted to just get as much experience as I could. So I ended up opening kind of a, a small agency where I would work. I, I call it an agency. It was more like I would try to work with people and get experience. So I started doing that. Um, and I ended up working with a guy in my, my home city in the UK for a couple of years and then ended up coming out stateside and I was working with um, kind of small small startups, helping them grow and scale. And mainly my whole, my whole kind of psyche is to learn, right? I'm always trying to learn, always trying to network with, with better people and learn. And so I was, you know, essentially just working with these startups, helping them scale. And just by chance, one of the startups I was working with, um, David, David Sangera, Roger's brother, he was my mentor and he, you know, he basically pushed me into what we're doing now with, uh, with e-commerce. And so, yeah, now, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be working with, uh, with those guys a lot. And, you know, we're essentially now just building brands. We're trying to build one brand a month. That's our goal. One new brand a month and then try to scale it as quickly as we can. Um, it's been a lot of hard work and now we're up to, I think, three brands. 
Um, but by the end of the year, you know, we hope to have, I reckon if we can get 10, that'd be pretty awesome. Very cool. So let's rewind a little bit and talk about the, sure. the, 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 the first, your first sort of foray into, into e-commerce, into drop shipping. Tell us how that started how, how, you know, and what happened there. Yeah, so I, I as, as a complete nerd, I used to go home after work and just make sales funnels for fun. Um, and this was early, early 2017. And so I just, we're just making random sales funnel, everything from like the classic dog necklaces that everyone tries to do when they first start. Um, and then we stumbled across um, lipstick and makeup brushes and they just crushed. Like we were we essentially, so we started using click funnels. That's how we started everything. And we didn't know what we were doing. We had no suppliers lined up. But we had like, I think it was like five or 6,000 orders for makeup brushes. And so we had to go to supply. It was, it was a real shit show. It was just charge backs galore. You know, it was, it was, it was really, really, you know, I, I was just learning everything like a million miles an hour. So we started doing that. And then, you know, we took that first lesson and tried to grow from it. So we ended up making a Shopify store, right? Because we could see, we thought the average order value would be higher if more people can add products on the front end, which ended up being true because, you know, people like the choice. And so we ended up making a brand on Shopify that we, again, we just, it was very AliExpress driven. Um, and so we ended up moving off of AliExpress after about a month to work with one supplier who worked with us for about three, about, yeah, about three months. And he, he, he was doing great. He was, he was charging us a premium. Now I know, now I'm in the know on the supply side, but he was definitely charging us a premium. Uh, but yeah, he was great and he supported us. He worked with us. He was Chinese, but spoke great English. Um, and so we started working with him and after about three months, so we scaled, scaled the company to seven figures inside of three months, which was, you know, wow. where I was at. Yeah, it was a really fantastic achievement and something I was really humbled by. Um, but after three months, we got in one day, we, I think it was like three or 400 different customers and they messaged our support and they were like, hey, um, it says my product is delivered in Chicago. And I was like, that's really odd. So I was looking through and every single person that we'd advertised and purchased from us in the past two weeks all had the same tracking number. And so, yeah, we, re we reach out uh, to the supplier and he just blocks us on everything. So we have to end up, we have to end up refunding thousands of customers. Oh and it was, it, yeah, and it was, it was such a shame. It was a massive, massive makeup brand. It was, and it was all driven by drop shipping. It would have died eventually, like most brands do with drop shipping, but it was great. And the, the organic engagement our page had was out, out, I've never seen anything like it even now. Um, it was, it was fantastic and we burned the brand. So it was so bad. And so we took about another probably, I think four months to bounce back. And that was mainly trying to find someone that we could trust as a, you know, a sourcing partner effectively. So we, we really learned from that lesson and it's a, you know, it's a shame because it would have been a massive, massive makeup brand, but you know, it happens unfortunately. And that's, you know, it's the nature of the business, especially when it's something risky, you know, we had no contracts up, nothing. So we yeah. had no, we, yeah. We had nothing to stand on. Where did you find the guy? Where did you find the, the guy the first time? Was he just an alley contact from, from one of those situations? Yeah, so we obviously, when you start doing volume through AliExpress, all of them will hit you up and try to make you exclusively use their store. And so we just started speaking to him because English was really good. And he was really easy to communicate with. He would give, you know, refunds and everything. You know what I mean? Like he, his, his service was a far and above you know, better than rest, and he could cope with our scale, right? Because that's another thing. A lot of them say they have stock on AliExpress, where they don't. Um, so, you know, he he would take risk and buy a product up front on the gamble that we're going to sell it, right? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't know what happened. Maybe it was a personal problem with him, but he just cut us completely and, you know, took a big, a big chunk of our money. Um, and then, you know, obviously the money we paid him plus the refunds, chargebacks, everything. So every every penny of profit we made, gone, everything. And then to make it even worse, this is a really sob, like sad sob story, but we had our, our last $6,000, right? Last six, and it was in PayPal, and PayPal put a hold on the $6,000 for 180 days. I've heard about and, these 180 day holds. Oh, oh my God, Ben Malal and, just and posted they, about yeah. one. Yeah, and they, they were right to do it, right? They were absolutely yeah. right to do it, and I, 
I, I understand the reason because our customers are complaining, right? But it was, I, I, sp- I spent, I think it was like three and a half hours on the phone to one of the PayPal reps. And I think he just felt so sorry for me. He ended up giving the money back. Wow. So, and that, that changed everything, everything that day. Cause that was the lowest point that we hit. And it was, it was pretty fucking bad. You know, we were really, really down and out. And it was, uh, one of those times where, you know, you really question yourself and you really, like it really takes a hit on your confidence. So you're like, shit, maybe I actually don't know what I'm doing. And, you know, we managed to turn things around and now, you know, we're, we're flying relatively high. You know, there's some other guys out there I know who absolutely crush it, but you know, we, we do okay compared to most. I was wondering, like, what do you account for the brand taking off the way it did? Like, what, why, like, that's obviously a skill you guys have at e-commerce X, which is that ability to create magnetic brands. But what do you credit, like, yeah, that, that, that takeoff was so immediate and abrupt and why you think it could have been such a great brand if you had the back end sort of out? Yeah, so we basically, the way, the way I look at things, especially e-commerce, you, there's a couple of facets, right? And for you as the marketing to work the way it did. So, you know, I'm, I'm not some kind of form of brand guru. I'm just fairly good at media buying, right? That's kind of my bread and butter. And so basically the, the reason why it took off. So we, the way I look at things, sorry, I'm kind of rambling is that you have, you have to have either have a great offer because Facebook doesn't really do much. All you're trying to do is, is entice the click, right? And try and drive the traffic. And so you either have to have a great offer something very unique. I know you spoke to Nick last week with the fidget spinner, right? It's a very unique product and it stands out. So people are, are likely to click or you have to have a really fantastic brand, right? Something like Apple where they could post anything and most people click through because they know the brand. Um, so we, to start, we tried to push them offers. So we were doing tons of like free, free plus shipping. And people, people love at the moment, love to say that things are dead in online marketing, right? Like drop shipping's dead, free, but none, none of that stuff is dead, right? It, it really kills if you can get it right to the right audience. There's a real fine balance on testing for the price. And so at the moment, that's, that's what we drive a lot of. And the reason why we have such an advantage over people is because of the sourcing, right? We can source products so much cheaper than the competition that it means we can make we can make our prices so low on the front end that people like you have to buy right it's like when you're walking down the supermarket aisle and someone offers you a free sample right you're gonna you're gonna at least try it and so what we really focus on is we actually try to focus on saturated markets the reason being if for example the makeup niche is so so saturated but i know that most people for the larger companies really suck at buying media, right? So Sephora, for example, yeah, the brand is very recognizable, but I guarantee they probably don't make much money through paid acquisition, right? Obviously, they don't, I don't really know, know what a funnel that. is probably, right? They don't, you know? It, 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 exactly, exactly. And it's, it relies on the brand. So I know if I can hit their audience with a way better offer, they're likely to at least try it, you know? And so, you know, we've, we've had stores that convert on Saturday, like seven or eight percent for, you know, wow. cold traffic, which is, yeah, it's pretty awesome. Obviously it's not always like that. We're happy if we can get three, three to five percent. That's pretty awesome. But yeah, we've had some days, especially at the start of an offer where it just goes gangbusters, you know, because it is, especially back then, kind of early to mid 2017, where your post would get way more organic reach as well. We would, we could run ads at break even, but because they were getting, there was so much engagement with the ads, we were making an extra like 30, 40% in revenue on top just from the organic shares that don't get tracked in, uh, in ads manager. Wow. So you say, yeah. so it's a combination of, uh, the, the pricing model that like when that came in, the pricing model, free press shipping was a big thing. You had a <laughs> brand that when you clicked through looked serviceable, like you put some sure. effort into the brand, you'd had some trust. Yeah. And then you made banger ads. You made excellent ads that drove excellent engagement. Would you say that was the formula for like rapid growth in the beginning there? Yes. Yeah, exactly. And we would just scale. We would be really, really aggressive with scaling. And it's, it, it's funny, our, our scaling has, and everything we do, our kind of fundamental core of the business has never really changed. What's changed is we're now trying to drive quality for the consumer rather than just trying to line our pockets with cash, right? So yeah. it's a lot more about 
how can we make the product better? How can we make the customer service better? How can we make the offer more clear and kind of less aggressive? Because that, that's the thing we push, we would push aggressive offers, which wouldn't, you know, wouldn't, we wouldn't force the customer to do anything, but it would be, it's one of those things where it's very, very tempting, where they may think that they're getting better value than they possibly are, right? Especially with dropshipping. Say you do makeup, we would have some customers that would love it and be really happy, but others would get it and the stuff would be like in half or cracked. You know, it's, it was really poor. So that's why, you know, a big reason for us moving because our repeat, oh, our, our, our repeat customer rate was just nothing. You know, it's, it was the pits because customers were never happy from really day one. And in a free plus shipping model, you sort of, you have to rely on, on repeat orders, I would think, right? Like you make a little bit on the, like, what are, can you give me an example of like what margins are like on a free plus shipping offer uh, at scale? Yeah. So we, we at the moment, we have a makeup brand and we actually, from our free plus offer, we make, it's like a 60% net margin, but 40 to 60%. It's, it's really good. So we use uh, one click upsell. Yep. Um, which tons of people use anyway. Um, and we essentially, we can just upsell them on the back end. So what we'll do is we'll say, Hey, get this free piece of makeup. And then on the back end, there may be, um, like a makeup kit, for example, right? Something, something, and that's where we make our money on the front end. We'll make nothing really, but on the back end is where we make our money. So I know our take rate on an upsell is about, I think it's about 50 to 55%. It's pretty high. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. So that's, so that's not even taking into account the, the longevity of building a brand and getting repeat orders. Like once that aspect is locked in more, which you're doing now, I guess it's going to add a whole other dimension to the business. Exactly. Um, yeah. So we, we see, I think kind of over the next five years, influencer marketing is probably going to be the most important facet in the business, especially for building the brand and the longevity. Um, whether it's kind of getting content from influencers or using influencers to essentially help you scale and get better engagement and trust with the brand. Uh, and that way we can charge a higher price point, right? Rather than going on the offer, we can then go on the brand because you're essentially skipping quite a few steps with, um, in the acquisition process because it builds so much more trust when it comes from someone else other than, you know, our brands. Brand equity. Okay. We'll get to influencer marketing a little bit, but I want to go, I want to go sure. back to, that plan that you guys hatched after you had after you you, you know you got screwed by, by that first situation you knew you had a vertical on your hands you, you knew how to do this stuff so what were your steps to try to build like a, a fully vertical you know how to, how did you come to own this vertical what were your steps you took to to find you know to put together sure. your, your your us fulfillment yeah so it's some, it's something we're still finalizing at the moment on the us side but essentially to, to start, it's all about trying to source, right? Because again, if we can source the product, even just like five cents cheaper, if you're doing 10 million bucks a year, that's a, just a huge saving. So we, we, we vetted, it was probably 15 or 20 different people that could do it. And we actually ended up finding a guy that did FDA. So he would find the product for Amazon customers. And this was actually at a time, again, you know, we had no money. And so I was telling him about this like grand scheme that I had for building this store. And I was like, but you need to front the money to get the product because we don't have it. And after about two weeks of speaking to the guy, he eventually just, he just thought, fuck it, I'll, I'll do it and gamble on it. So he did it. And uh, yeah, ever since then, you know, he's now, a, you know, an integral part of our team. So sourcing was the most important, whether it's trying to source something that's cheap or something that's quality, it makes such a world of difference when you have boots on the ground out there. So we, we still ship from China worldwide, um, because it's, it's very difficult to do from the US, but our US is our biggest market by far. So we also have, um, a fulfillment center. So in, initially we shipped, pro we imported products and they went to a 3PL in, um, Henderson, Nevada. Okay. Um, and yeah, now kind of the, the next step for us, I think is, you know, having a fulfillment center, um, and which we're kind of making roads into. Cause again, we were very driven by the numbers. So if, even if we can just save 10 cents on the fulfillment cost, again, it, it really adds up over the years, which means you know, we can hire more people, build more brands and grow a bigger company. Very cool. So you're still shipping from China currently, mostly? Um, we don't mix. 
You do a mix, it, it okay. depends. Anything that's ordered in, yeah, anything that's ordered in the US will be shipped from the US. Anything that's ordered, well, outside of the US will usually get shipped from China. Okay, well, that's great. And, and most of your business is in the US. So yes. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cutting shipping times in more than half, right? Like that's basically taking oh. it from 30, 45 days to a week kind of Massively. thing? Massively, yeah. I, it's, I, I think we ship, we, we usually pick and pack within the same day. Um, and it was shipped the same day, maybe in the morning, but yeah, shipping will take three days versus drop shipping. It can take 14 to, I think two months on, yeah. for, on orders for people, which is, it's crap, right? You, when we live in a world of instant gratification, nobody wants to wait two months to get a product, even if the value is really, really good, you know? So again, you burn, you burn your brand that way. Yeah, so so here's another question. How did you find this guy? Did you have to have boots on the ground? Did you guys go to China and, and interview this guy or you just sort of rigorously went through a bunch of potential people and, and found a great person? Yeah, um, it, pretty much just that. So I, I actually, there's, there's this guy I actually found on Facebook. He just wrote a really great um, post in one of the e-com groups and I was like, oh, I should speak to him. And we just kind of had a pretty 30 minute formal conversation and so he's an Irish chap, so we got a lot in common, and he's really, really funny, and we just got just got along really, really well. Um, and yeah, we, and, you know, that's it. You know, it was we, it wasn't anything special. It was more luck than anything. But he was he's really been like kind of the saving grace of the company, and has helped us out no end. And like, I'll get, give a great example. Uh, one of our products we ordered, and it came in completely the wrong color. And so he flew out to China like seven days before Christmas and got, got stuff fixed, you know? So that kind of mentality where he'll drop anything to, you know, get shit done is something that is like really important to us as a company for sure. It's, it's very cool. It's a very cool story. So, so you've got this brand, uh, it's, it's growing. You've got, you've got massive plans for expansion. Uh, and you intend on, on, on leveraging influencer marketing a little bit. I know, I know we, uh, you know, I talked with Nick Shackelford, uh, before yep. the guy has some serious Kung Fu when it comes to, to micro influencer marketing and putting programs like that together. You, you know, you say this is, you see this as a bit huge growth opportunity for the business. Just talk a little bit about what you're seeing so far and why you're so confident that it's gonna, that it's gonna go. Yeah. So uh, number one, the reason why we're, we're not really pivoting, but we're trying to open up an, another traffic revenue, or another traffic source. For, sorry, and the reason why is because we, as marketers, it's not just me. I think I speak for the whole community. Have seen a really big shift in the way Facebook is doing things. They're getting really, really strict on everything from copyright to how aggressively people are running ads, and people are getting banned. They're getting in trouble, right? So now. For us, the reason why we're moving towards influencers and specifically micro influencers is just mainly for the different traffic source, but also because it gives the brand way, way, way more equity. It's way easier to build a brand from word of mouth from somebody who's a trusted source like an influencer than it is us constantly barraging out ads to people who potentially don't want to see it, right? Yeah. Um, you turn those so, ads off. If face, you turn those ads off and the sales go away. Whereas with, uh, you know, building brand equity, it creates a, a perpetual engine potentially, right? It, it, exactly, exactly. And um, I actually was lucky enough the other day to speak to the co-founder or the for, sorry, former CEO of MeUndies. And he, super freaking, super sharp guy, really, really smart. And he, he told me some really, really fantastic stories about what they, what, you know, what they were doing at MeUndies. I'm pretty sure they grew their company with like zero ad spend all through influencers and look at it now you know people it, it's, it's a, a household it's a massive, name massive, massive brand. it's pretty much a household yeah, name like i exactly. hear it, you know yeah. that's interesting yeah okay. so so that's the thing for me we want to start looking at creating more durable brands because we can make short-term cash with drop shipping but or you know kind of these brands where you just have super aggressive offers but if you want a brand that's going to last 10 years and sell for 30 50 100 million dollars further down the road then it needs to be durable you know customers obviously need to keep coming back to it because you'll find although the us is a massive market you can saturate within i think really within 12 months we've seen you know one of our stores we've gone really 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 aggressive over the last 12 months and we're just starting to see now 
where like we really can't hit many more people. You know, we're just hitting the same people over and over again with the same offer, which you know is not that effective a strategy. Yeah. So what, what like I, the theme I'm interested in across all of e-commerce is this idea of ascension. You know, ascending through learning the ropes, cutting your teeth how you have to. And, and then and then finding the strategies to kind of to really to really move up. It's interesting that even you know you guys who are building brands who are you know not having the shipping time issues that so many of the other people in the space are. You're still feeling the pinch from Facebook when it comes to uh, the tactics you're using and to the reach that you're that you're able to achieve even, which is even more interesting. And I, th- I think blindness comes into it a lot as well, right? When you're hammering people day after day, uh, they're definitely you know they're going to become more blind to your brand even if you put some energy into it essentially. Um, what I'm interested, can we back up a little bit also and talk about how you guys build? Because I'm really interested in the interplay between ClickFunnels and Shopify and where people are using which and, and whether, you know, it seems like there's a, you know, people start with Shopify and now I think there's, there, there's this sense, you know, you're going to be able to, to create higher value AOV when you employ ClickFunnels in sort of in, in you know, with, but then you want to find a solution where your load times are faster than ClickFunnels can, can, can manage. And so you can go to a hard coding situation. Can, can you sort of talk about, about your journey with, with funnels? Yeah. So we, we actually, so we started with the ClickFunnels move Shopify. So we, we exclusively now work just with Shopify. Um, and so all we'll ever do is drive people to a collection page. Um, so we, we don't really use any kind of pre or advertorials. Um, I think we probably will start adopting that over the next kind of six to eight months. But in terms of all we're doing is driving to the collection page, um, and then, you know, upselling on the back end. It's, you know, it's, it's that simple, but in terms yeah. of kind of how we, I think how we test is in essentially say yes to an idea so what we'll do is we'll build we'll build a store from you know the ground up we'll put you know a few thousand dollars into having our team build a store and then probably you know another three to five thousand dollars and driving traffic and at this point we have no product nothing all we're trying to do is just test the concept and then once we test the concept and it's it works what we'll end up doing is then sending an email to the customers and it's essentially um, a, a drip sequence that says, hey, we're actually out of stock. And it's usually a, a four to six week email that says, you know, we're out of stock. And, um, you know, we'll go through showing them like, the manufacturing process, everything. So they feel very involved with the brand. Mm-hmm. And we've, we, yeah, we've had very, very few issues when we do that. So it allows us to validate, it allows us to buy time, and it allows us to generate cash flow for the product. That's really interesting. So basically, yeah. So telling the story of the brand during the shipping times in order to alleviate yes. it. Exactly. That, exactly. That's a hack it, right yeah. there. Yeah, and it works. It works really well. We just use Clavio, set it up. We get some really nice pictures of the product being made. You know, we tell a story about the brand. Everything. So it builds a relation. You know, the customer builds a relationship over something that would ruin most businesses. You know, so we take the the kind of almost a Kickstarter model. Right, where you're they technically, you know, they can take two years and they take all of this money up front. But after two years, you get updated every couple of months. We just shorten that sequence and then, you know, send it out to our customers. And we make sure as well we have a big, big customer service team that's always there to deal with people. And, you know, if people want a refund, we'll just give them a refund. You know, it's not, it's not the end of the world. Yeah. Um, I, that's, that's the way you got to operate for sure. So you are the, you know, you're, you're, you have this founding team. How many, how many are on your founding team, on your partners? So we technically, it's uh, it's Roger and I, uh, Roger Sangera. He's yep. he's my co-founder, and then David does a lot of mentoring for us. So te- technically, kind of, I, I guess you would probably say like two and a half, because um, you know Dave David's been really good at you know guiding us. He's done this time and time and time again with other companies, so it's been really good to have him you know as a mentor for Roger and I. Very cool. So, what's the split between you and Roger and, and your your focus in the business? What, what, why do you guys complement each other so well? Yeah. So, Roger deals a lot more with the the operational side, um, customer service side. He's also very very creative. So, he's fantastic at coming up with angles for ads, uh, offer ideas, and, and everything else. And he takes a lot off of my plate when I'm just you know running media. So my, my job really day to day is pretty much just paid acquisition. That's it. So over, over the next, I think 12 months, we're actually going to start building out our, uh, media mind team 
because we've ran a really, really bootstrap operation up yeah. until now. We should we really we should have done this maybe three to six months ago, but we've only just we're only now located in one place. Before I was down in SoCal, and Roger was in Northern California, so we've only just got into one geo. So now, now you know we've got an office, and we're going to be you know looking out to build out teams. So then I can start doing more of the operational stuff you know, from day to day. So. Roger will take anything from, you know, helping source products, working with, on the fulfillment side. Um, and then, you know, when we're doing kind of collaborative hours in the office, he'll, you know, he'll work with me to, you know, create media and run angles and all that other good stuff that goes into marketing. Very cool. So you, uh, were you guys, you guys were together on your first project as well? Yes. The first yeah. Well. yeah so what, what brought you guys together? How did you know, like, like how early did you know that you guys would, could form such a formidable founding team? Yeah, so back in, I think it was end of 2016, like I said, David was my mentor, uh, uh, one of the companies I worked with, and he was like, oh, you should, uh, you should meet my brother. I think you, you would get on really well. So we ended up going out, um, having a beer, and we just, we just got on like a house on fire. Um, and I know, I, I know people that will get on really well as friends, but won't get on in business, right? Like they will butt heads. But it's, it's one of those things that I think we're both pretty patient. Um, and where he has weaknesses, I compliment and where I have weaknesses, he compliments as well. Whereas he, he's, he's very, very good at the networking side. Um, and I'm way more of an introvert and a lot more rational and logical around the numbers. So where I only see one way, he sees something completely different. So it, it works, it works really well. And it's a, it's a really good compliment, uh, for the business as well. That's very cool. It's, I'm always interested yeah. in finding out, yeah, those core features of, of founding teams, especially ones that have done, you know, all, you know, the great things that you guys have. So I wanted to ask you about your performance. Your, you know, you're a performance marketer. That's your sure. main skill. What, what are your strongest features within that? You're, you say, you know, your analytics. You're, you're very strong on the numbers. You're very, you know, you're very strong with testing. Very strong with scaling. Like, where is your biggest strength as a as a Facebook marketer specifically? Yeah, so really, I think a lot of it comes down to, I, I know our audience very, very well. We, we focus specifically in the beauty niche. So I know with really, most people all hate that I say this, but I know within a few dollars of spend on an ad, how it's going to perform. So my my real strength comes in, I think, A, being able to actually read data, which is should be very simple, but most people do not know how to do it. And B, the, the kind of the velocity I can, you know, I can just sit and I don't seem to burn out too much. So I can just sit, churn out campaigns, no problems. Um, and then as well, I'm kind of full stack in the way that I, I can make videos. I can, you know, I can do pretty much everything, right? Which is, it's kind of a pain in the ass because I like to do everything. I like to have control. Whereas, you know, maybe I could outsource it, but I can do everything, which I know that as we build a team, it's a great skill to have because I can do every single job of every person in the team. So I know what to expect of people. I know how quick people need to work and I can set reasonable goals around what they're doing. Um, nice. and yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's really as simple as that, you know, Facebook, Facebook, there's no like silver bullet, there's no magic to it. It's a lot, it's just hard work. And if you're running a store, if you can churn out campaigns quicker than the next guy, chances are you're going to be the most successful. Especially if you can combine them with, with decent creative elements as well, I think. Like, I wanted to ask a little, cause I know a lot of people are talking right now about video creatives and obviously Facebook, uh, is cracking down heavily on people who are ripping other people's, uh, videos. What's your solution for videos look like? So, yeah, we, we do a, a few different things. So when we first get a product, we'll, we'll basically pay girls to fire to do testimonials and everything else, right? So we'll send them the product and we'll just say, Hey, try it on and give an honest review of what you think. So that's number one. One thing we've started to do, um, we should be rolling out in the next month, is reaching out to kids on college campuses. Because I know I was strapped for cash as a college kid, and so if you can get reviews from those people, that's also good. Um, and then our next step is gonna be into the influencer side as well, so trying to kind of get ambassadors on board who can really kind of crank up the, you know, the content they're putting out so we're going to be investing heavily uh on that side because we want to we want it to feel as natural as possible whereas the fiber girls always feels quite forced um 
and the college kids are a little bit better. But you know, a lot of these a lot of these people who you know are influencers are absolute pros at what they do and can really really make the difference. And the great thing is, if you can get them to make you know three to five videos each, and you're hitting up a new a new influencer every single day, that's that's a new campaign. You can just crank out, and then because you're driving dollars to the campaigns, you know what influencer your audience like. So you're just you're consistently learning more and more and more about, you know, the needs and wants of your audience. It's going to be such an interesting evolution for performance marketers, you know, where they're used to these these systems that are already built where you're just putting dollars in and you're seeing conversions come out. You yeah. know, th this whole influencer space is counterintuitive in, in, counterintuitive in some ways for performance marketers because you're relying on, on less metrics. But then again, there are these people building systems and strategies that do allow you to, to, to really quantify it a little bit more. And, and attribute it a little bit more. It's going to be really interesting to see the way it evolves. Who's doing it the, the best you've seen right now out there? Um, so in, in, on the influencer side, as a company, um, Fashion Over is amazing. Like really, really, really good. They are everywhere. Smashbox does a fantastic job. Um, in terms of people, um, it's actually the last two people we've had on, uh, on the podcast. I know Van... He, he does a really, really cool job. He's a good friend of mine. Um, and I know Nick. Nick does a really, really great job as well. So we actually, actually had a phone conversation with Nick during the week, and he dropped. And us uh, with Nick and Jake, both of them, sorry, um, are doing an amazing job, and they both dropped some yeah, really, really great knowledge and you know, were really, really great with, uh, with helping us out. So we're definitely going to take that and, and run with it. But right now, it's still a very manual process, right? It's really a, a, yes. a, a, it's a spreadsheet, like look at each person, try to understand how, how, how good their engagement is. Like there's no, there's no silver bullet, you know, framework or system for it yet, right? It's like, or there is a system, but it's something you've got to do fairly manually as far as I understand. Yeah, it's, it's completely manual. So you're essentially just trawling through the data. The only way at the moment to get around it is to hire a VA. So we, we do do that in terms of we hire a VA to compile everything. But the issue with that is nobody knows your, you know, the ideal customer better than you. So what my VA in the Philippines, although he kicks ass and he's fucking awesome, he may not be in the same mindset when it comes to picking you know, the right person that represents my brands. So yeah, it's, it's a real pain in the ass. And eventually once we nail down a system, then we'll just bring someone in house to hire. Yeah. I think that's, that's going to just free you guys up in so many ways when you can systematize a little bit more of, of your, you've already building out amazing exactly. processes, as you say. So a matter of, uh, of scaling up you guys, there's, there's sort of no limits to what I think you guys can achieve in 2018. Do you feel pressure? No, I, I, I love it. I'm so, I, this is a thing. I don't really love the products and the brands themselves. I love the process. I love the systems and I love the nature of the business. I love the fact that I can press a few buttons on my computer and it's immediately going to change the cash flow I make over the next, you know, few weeks. It's, it, it you know, it, it, I, yeah, I, no, I feel really, really fortunate. And I think we, as a company, made those mistakes at the perfect time because I think getting started today, it's not impossible by any means, but it's a lot harder and it's a lot more competitive. You know, every, every six months, it just gets so much more expensive and so much harder. And you're not just having something simple, like not being able to source the product from some, somewhere other than AliExpress, you then, you know, you're penned in and it's, it's really difficult. And, you know, it's, I've made so many mistakes and I always, always make mistakes, but now I'm fortunate enough that I know if I do fuck up, I can just speak to someone like Van or message Nick or, you know, some other guys that we have in a private mastermind and it's a lot easier to pick, you know, pick the pieces back up because you're working with higher level people, which means you can get high level results at a quicker pace than someone who's just started and has zero contacts. It really is about like it's about ascension. You you know you can there's still this amazing opportunity, but you have to look at these examples of people who've been able to go through this stuff already and evolve from it. And you need to have that in your mindset. If you think you're going to be, well, it, it, it's possible you could become a millionaire. You could do really really well still just drop shipping if you pick the right niche. It's like you have to innovate in like two or three different categories. You you have to innovate in, in you know the 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 the. the, uh, the 
the product or the or the funnel or the sure. the ad, right? You need to innovate in like two or three of those spots to really make it, it to make it big. I feel like. Yeah, and I, I think you know that's that's very true, and that's why we we as a company are just starting to evolve because there's there's so much risk with drop shipping. No, no merchants actually take drop shipping, um, which I I don't think is very fair. But I also understand. So there's at any one point if you get kicked off a of Stripe or Shopify or PayPal, you, you know you're buggered. And the issue as well is cash flow just gets it's so much worse with drop shipping. It's really really is very difficult. You know we're lucky now that we have really generous credit cards, so we can you know pump money into ad spend. And you know, get it back at the end of the month. But in terms of the you know the innovation side, yeah, innovating the processes has been it's been the hardest part of the business for sure. Really, really hard. The media buying has been the easiest part. Every, everything else that goes into it has been really very difficult, and it's been a very expensive and in some ways quite costly. But there are mistakes that needed to happen for us to learn because there is really there is no playbook. I know. Um, Nick Perini has a really great, fantastic free course. Um, I know you're doing a lot in, in the space as well. So it's, it, it's evolving, but it's a space that still has miles, miles to go, you know, and people, people, even the high level guys, you know, everyone's still working it out and, you know, working out how to do things best because it's difficult. And, and the most amazing part, like, it's just such a, a fun world to be a part of. And when you can get together with the caliber of people that we're all getting together with and the way this sort of like new model of cooperative, collaborative business is evolving, like the, the three different masterminds that I did in, in 2017, it's, you know, and 2018, they're just in the beginning. They've all intermingled already and people are all working from different ones, different people that have all met across these are all, are all doing really amazing things together. And it's, uh, it, it's a super fun thing to be a part of. I, I know exactly what you mean about this, the, the drive you feel to, to, to keep going. Yeah, and it's, I know, I know a lot of affiliate guys and they're, a lot of them are very hidden and they kind of have to be in their nature. So they, they're le a lot less about giving value. Whereas I find with a lot of e-com guys, everyone is very, very, very open and very willing to share. You know, I, I still help ton tons of people. I get messages every day on Facebook from random people and I'll always try to help out where I can. You know, because I, I feel, A, feel very, very, very lucky to be where I am because certain people have given me the time of day and, you know, been willing for me to make mistakes and pick me up and put me, put me on the right path. So, you know, I think it's a really big thing about, you know, trying to give back and help, help out, you know, the, I don't think less fortunate is maybe the right word, but, you know, helping out people who are a little new at the space. Who don't have the experience. And it's, I think it comes down to the fact that affiliates, you know, they're inherently living on an exploit. They're inherently living on a, on an idea or an angle that they have. Whereas in e-commerce, it's a business, it's a brand, it's it's all these other things that you know, have to go into it um, to tackle it effectively. So it's you know you can give away you know Ben can give away his amazing tactics for for, for micro influencer marketing uh, because well he's a special case because he happens to be on one of the world's most popular reality shows. Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, but yeah, it's, it, 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 I think that's maybe a, a key reason for that difference in the, in the openness of the communities. Exactly, exactly. And I, I think it's really important and for everyone else to grow, it, it, makes, it makes the world a difference. You know, it, re it really, really does. And I've been to obviously a few, a few different networking events with you and just the amount of people that are willing to help you. Like I said, even the people that absolutely crush it, it's a, re it's a really, really open community. And I just hope it moves fast enough so certain people who I want to name don't, uh, you know, I think trash the space, which can happen obviously very easily as soon as people start throwing up random courses online, which you know I've seen. But at the moment, they get called out pretty badly. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting thing to be a part of. So um, there was yeah. one other thing you had mentioned something about product testing, about a, a new sort of like implementation you guys are doing for product testing. Was that was did we already cover that, or is that something you wanted to talk about? Yeah, so I, I we covered it briefly. Where we essentially all do is we'll come up, we'll basically have a product that we like. Let's just take um, I don't know, let's AirPods, right? Nice. And so then what we'll do is we'll, we'll we'll build a brand and we'll just, as I mentioned, we'll just drive traffic. So we'll make it. It, it will look 
absolutely, you know, fully legit. It doesn't look like some crappy click funnels page. You know, it, it looks and feels like a quality, a quality brand. And then regarding how aggressive you want to be with the offer, offer, you know, we'll work it out and we'll do a bunch of testing. Um, and then we'll see, you know, where the price is that converts. And then once we have that data and we put, you know, say a thousand to five thousand dollars of ad spend behind it, then we can work out the economics and say, okay, if it's at this price, this is where it converted. We'll need to, you know, our AOV on the back end will have to be, say, like $25 for us to at least break even. So then we'll work at everything out. We'll work with our sourcing guy and then we'll say, hey, we need to try and get the product for about this price to make, you know, minimum 25% net profit. Very so, cool. it, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's a pretty simple formula. And in terms of how we kind of think of the funnels, what we'll do is we'll find, again, right, airports. I might go to Apple and we'll study their entire funnel, front end and back end, emails, everything. And then all we'll do is we'll have a developer go and make the funnel in terms of a UI and UX like very similar. Because why spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to test the funnel when someone at Apple, which has like probably already done it, right? So you can go in, it's kind of, I know Russell Brunson um, kind of has a very similar method, which is kind of where we got it from. So, you know, you're, you're not copying directly, so it hurts any IP, but you're taking the fundamentals from the landing page and, you know, implementing them in yours so that the experience is simple. Brilliant. Yeah. The, just the core mechanics that of the best, you know, best company in the world, uh, you might as well exactly. take what you can. Very, very exactly. cool. Nice. Well, I don't want to take up much more of your time here. I know this is sure. this episode will air uh, next week, I guess, which will be after St. Patrick's Day. But I think you're a fitting guest here to have on uh, <laughs> <laughs> to, have, uh, to have on uh, right from St. Patrick's Day. So you're gonna have a, a good time in Chicago, where they you were telling me they dye the river yes. green. Yeah, I know. I so I've, I've been to Chicago before for work, but I've I've, I've heard it's a riot on Paddy's Day. So. As an Englishman and as a, a lover of all beer, I'm really, really excited and also excited to see a green river. I think that's going to be pretty wild. Nice. Well, I hope you have a great time out and we will be seeing you, I'm Thank sure, you. in Barcelona. Yeah, I need to uh, need to get my stuff sorted. But yeah, I'm uh, I'm really excited. I think that's going to be a massive event. So, And I love Barcelona. So two of my favorite things, but marketing in Barcelona, can't get any better. Very cool. Nice. Well, if you're listening to this, make sure you go check out iStackTraining.com slash ECML dash Europe, where we're, uh, prices go up in about four days. Prices go up about every two weeks for the ticket. So the sooner you get them, uh, the better. It's going to sell out. Uh, we're going to be hanging out. It's going to be a, a really good time. I can't wait for it. Uh, Sam, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Say hey to the same guy bros for me. I definitely will. Okay. We'll be in touch. Talk to you later. Awesome. Thank you, mate. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.